Well, uh, the crucial thing that's really changed with the, the British-Irish Parliamentary Assembly as it now is, uh, reflecting on the fact that it now has a bigger representation from the Northern Ireland Assembly and both the Unionist parties are now attending, is that you do get a, uh, a debate which involves politicians and republic, politicians from uh, from the north and also politicians from the rest of the UK and uh, with particular reference to the devolved institutions as well. So it's actually the only body which brings together all the sides of all the parliamentary institutions in both islands. And in recent times the concept has been it should work more closely with the BIC, the British Irish Council, which was set up under the Good Friday Agreement. And that's obviously, I think, completely logical because British Irish Council was basically meant to be about East West relations. So you have a body of work, you have a good group of people, you have important things being said. The other side of the coin is you have to be realistic, and Mark Durkin reminded us of it today. But I mean, the BIC, for example, still does not have a dedicated secretariat. And I can remember David Trimble and Mark Durkin arguing for this a decade ago. I mean, one of the things that Durkin said this morning was that he thought that the DUP would try and renegotiate a return to the arrangements for the selection of First and Deputy First Minister that uh, characterised the original agreement, uh, um, because the changes that they instigated were of course it dominated by the fact that they did not want to be seen purely aesthetically and cosmetically. At the time that they were putting Sinn Féin into government, they did not I want to actually be physically seen doing it. Uh, and the difficulty with that change now is by saying it's the largest party which has the choice of first and second largest party deputy first minister is that there is a possibility arising out of the next election given the current three-way split in unionist popular support that Sinn Féin will be the largest party and the DUP calculates that the unionist community couldn't live with that although it is a purely symbolic issue first and deputy first minister are it is a co-premiership uh, um, it is, you know there is no real difference in the status but nonetheless you can argue that they're probably right that it would be very hard to uh, accept for, for many unionists. So now Durkin was arguing that was one of the things he thought, he thought the whole pattern of these negotiations was for people, if they move on pleasing and justice to say well we need a uh, confidence building measure and this is the confidence building measure and he's entirely right to say historically that's the pattern of these negotiations and there may be other things in the mix too. There's a whole question about uh, uh, about vetoes and communal vetoes in the legislation of Northern Ireland. Frankly, I regard those attempts as uh, as a really pie in the sky. That discussion, in in, in the in the short to medium term, anyway. Very high risk for Sinn Fein. I mean, the crucial question here, of course, is how strong is the aspiration for Irish unity in in, in, in the Catholic community, which does, by the way, overwhelmingly vote for nationalist parties, and therefore it has to be at least reasonably strong. Um, but one of the things that my sense of the polling on this is that um, Catholic support for the Union, a lot of it was materially based. It was based on a calculation that you know the UK was the safer place to be economically. Yeah. Now, for the last 10 or 15 years, in my view, that was eroding somewhat. That people were thinking that because of the success of the Irish Republic, within a reasonable period of time, uh, Irish unity might be viable economically. Now the problem for Sinn Féin now is that we may be living in a consequence where there will be some return to, of that Northern Catholic caution about a united Ireland because of the economic consequences, because the Republic is clearly much more exposed than Northern Ireland and the UK has been in this current crisis. So I think it's a high risk um, uh, 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 request. I'd have to say that uh, you know this, it raises this whole issue of the border poll and it would be harder to argue against it if, if you were a party which was saying we want this in, in, in a census question. I mean, why not do it by a border poll? And you and I were talking earlier about things that journalists get wrong, which is always annoying. Uh, uh, one of the things that my you were talking about, your pet beefs about misquotations and misrepresentations, one of my pet beefs of the Northern Ireland media is that they always say that the agreement says that once you have a border poll, there must be another one within seven years. The agreement does not say that. The agreement says there can't be another one for seven years. It doesn't actually say you're in a rolling process of every seven years you have a, you, you, you have a border poll, you must have one. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I just would make that point that I think that 
if the border poll issue arises now i actually think it's less pressing issue i thought there was a point when the border poll could have been used as a device to help the center crowd particularly the ulster unionists uh, um, at a time when there was a great concern about these questions to underpin the deal uh, i don't really think we're in that moment now and i think this is all a little bit hypothetical and, and, and not a moment of current politics but this position that Sinn Féin is pushing does actually lead to the possibility that they might get something like a border poll and um, they might get an outcome that they you know rather like elections in the Irish Republic in recent times given the outcomes they didn't expect they might also get an outcome they don't expect although nobody can predict that result. I mean I've, I've always taken the view that you couldn't seriously argue that the citizens of the United Kingdom didn't have a right to be involved in British political parties and um, most of the time when I was involved in that argument was an argument about the Labour Party but in all conscience you can't make a distinction it, it must apply also to the Conservative Party um, therefore in theory I don't think there can be a problem with this uh, um, it, 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 and, I, and I also think that it ought to not be as some believe, some kind of threat to the stability of institutions. First of all, the Conservatives are completely committed to the devolved settlement and the Good Friday Agreement. Secondly, I do still think there is a kind of, and even was referred to this morning by Peter Hayne, um, a kind of thing in Northern nationalism, which was given to it by the Good Friday, by the Hillsborough Agreement in 1985, this idea that someday, somehow, there's some deal we could do with the British government to make some decisive intervention against the unionists. That's in the psyche, for a very good reason. It's happened once, uh, and therefore it's not at all surprising that they feel that way about it. But I do think, and that, there, that there's a tendency still, I mean, Peter Hayne was actually giving examples how in recent negotiations, Sinn Féin were asking him, well, why don't you just impose this, in this case, Irish language, and he was saying to them, no, it's not really. You know, why are you asking the British government to sort this out for you? But they, it's in the psyche, and I do think that from the point of view of the nationalist argument for Irish unity and the best possible case that you can make for Irish unity, it's actually not helpful. And that this desire to always look for that, you know, behind doors move. And I think that one of the consequences of this will be is if there's a Cameron government, it will it, that will leave the psyche because there really isn't any question that there's a different position. This is a generational switch among young Tories. It's a cultural shift. The Tories of the Chris Patton generation, in my view, when they thought about Northern Ireland, thought in terms which are perfectly understandable, in terms of their age group, civil rights, discrimination against Catholic, that was the first thing that came into their mind. Uh, uh, of course, one must, you know, the union should exist on the basis of consent, but must put that right. The Tories of the current generation, the age they are, the first thing they think about about Northern Ireland is the IRA campaign and what a bad thing that was. Uh, um, that's just the way it is. This new generation of Tories are mentally and emotionally in a different place from the, 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 the Tories of the, of, of the Thatcher era. And that is something which is just a fact of political life. These shifts of opinion change. And that's where we're now approaching uh, the consequences of that if, and I still think it's an if, Cameron wins an overall majority. The cultural shift that I've talked about among Tories uh, uh, is something that people in Northern Ireland haven't actually picked up on very much. Uh, so many ordinary unionists still identify the Tories with the agreement uh, of 85, which they see as a betrayal. Many ordinary unionists are labour inclined. It might be so. I think it is perfectly obvious that the uh, the key appeal of this uh, alliance is in a carefully defined number of seats in the greater Belfast area, um, which are some of which in the European election seem to be, in a, as far as we can tell, in a fluid situation where the DUP is surprisingly weak, but the European election was an ideal negative storm for the DUP. There are factors that work against them which won't be at work in a general election. So you can perhaps read too much into that. So it may well be so that it simply doesn't garner enough support. But I would say this, that nobody in the media or chattering class in Northern Ireland predicted the result that Nicholson got. It's absolutely absent from the media chatter or commentary leading up to the election. And therefore, to that extent, we are in a situation which is unpredictable.